It's Global News and Zuma Nigeria. Many thanks for joining me. The headline says over 2,500 dead missing in Mediterranean in 2023. U.S. offers 5 million U.S. dollars for Ecuador election murder insight. Ukrainian drone hits Russian power substation. U.S. National Security Agency launches AI Security Center and Swedish Prime Minister seeks help from military. So far this year, over 2,500 people have died or gone missing while trying to cross the Mediterranean to Europe, the United Nations Refugee Agency said, while around 186,000 people have arrived in European countries during the same period. Director of the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, UNHCR office in New York, Ruven Menik Dewela, told the United Nations Security Council on Thursday that of the 186,000 who had crossed the Mediterranean, 83%, some 130,000 people landed in Italy. Other countries where people who had crossed the Mediterranean had landed included, included Greece, Spain, Cyprus, and Malta. The number of those who died or were missing during the dangerous sea crossing has increased this year compared with last year, the Security Council was told. By September 24th, over 2,500 people were, on, were accounted as dead or missing in 2023 alone, Mini Kidwela said. That number marked a large increase over the 1,680 who died or were missing in the same period in 2022. He said the UN Refugee Agency saw no end in sight to the life lost at sea and on land routes to Europe, which are likewise hazardous. The UNHCR official told the Council how the land journey from sub-Saharan African countries to sea crossing departure points on the Tunisian and Libyan coasts remain one of the world's most dangerous. Over 102,000 people tried to cross the Mediterranean from Tunisia, a 260% addition from last year, and over 45,000 had tried to cross from Libya, Mini Dequela said. The UNHCR tolls were same to those presented by Pat Livjert, director of the International Office for Migration, IOM. Recent IOM data demonstrates that from January to September 2023, over 187,000 individuals crossed the Mediterranean in pursuit of a better future and the promise of safety, Lil Jert told the Youth Security Council. Tragically, during the same period, IOM recorded 2,778 deaths, with 2,093 of them occurring along the treacherous central Mediterranean route, he said, referring to the most dangerous sea crossing. Adding that yet, despite its clear dangers in 2023, there has been an increase in arrivals to Greece along with this route of over 30%, while the number of arrivals in Spain has remained steady, primarily through the Atlantic route to the Canary Islands as compared to the numbers recorded at the same time last year. IOM also saw a major surge in arrivals to Italy with 130,000 so far this year compared with 70,000 in 2022. The United States has proclaimed a reward of up to $5 million U.S. million for information into the killing of Ecuadorian presidential candidate Fernando Valenciano. Secretary of State Antony Blinken explained in a statement on Thursday that multiple assassins attacked Vela Vicencio, the Movimento Century Party's presidential candidate, in the 2023 elections as he left a Quito campaign event on August 9th. The murder sends reactions through Ecuador, which was at the time 11 days away from holding its general elections. Blinken's statement comes in the lead up to a runoff election on October 15th to determine Ecuador's next president. The United States will continue to support the people of Ecuador and work to bring to justice individuals who seek to undermine democratic processes through violent crime, Blinken said. Villa Valencencio, an ex journalist, joined the race as an in anti-corruption candidate after years as a prominent critic of former President Rafael Correa and his allies. But at the end of his August 9th campaign rally, he was shot in the head as he entered his car. One suspect was also killed as security at the event returned fire. According to Blinken's statement, six more suspects, all from Colombia, remain in the custody of the Ecuadorian National Police. They are deemed to be part of an organized crime unit. 
In recent years, Ecuador has been in the grasp of intensifying violence, mostly after the COVID-19 pandemic significantly weakened the country's economy. Authorities say gangs have taken advantage of the economic insecurity to increase their reach into Ecuador, a country positioned on the Pacific coast between major cocaine-producing regions in Colombia and Peru. The number of homicides has skyrocketed as a result, surging by 500% between 2016 and 2022, according to report. That puts Ecuador among the countries with the highest rates of murder in Latin America, a stark contrast to Ecuador's previous reputation as a country with moderately low violence. The country has also recently endured political upheaval as President Guillermo Lassa became the first president to invoke Muerte Cruzada or mutual death, a power set forth in the constitution. Now talking Russia-Ukraine war, Kursi regional governor Roman Starovot said a combat drone released explosives on an electricity substation in a Russian village of Belaya, close to the border with the Ukraine, while Russia's Ministry of Defense reported showed down over a dozen Ukrainian drones over the Russian regions of Belgorod, Kursk and Kulaga. One of the transformations Transformers rather caught fire. Five settlements and a hospital were cut off from power supply. Fire crews rushed to the scene. He said power will be restored as soon as it is safe to do so. Earlier, Russia authorities said two Ukrainian drones were destroyed over the neighboring Belgorod region. The defense ministry in Moscow said the first drone was thwarted at about 5 p.m. local time. And Thursday, a second drone was brought down about four hours later. Later, a report citing Russia's defense ministry said 10 Ukrainian drones were brought down over the Kursk region overnight and one over the Kaluga region. Ukraine has strengthened its raids on Russian territory in recent weeks, with the regions of the country now regularly subject to waves of Ukrainian drone attacks that have sporadically damaged buildings, including in Moscow. While Russian officials have modulated their importance, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky reiterated this week that attacks and aims in Russia would increase. On cyber security, the United States National Security Agency, NSA, has announced the establishment of an artificial intelligence security center that will supervise the development and integration of AI capabilities within U.S. defense and intelligence services. General Paul Naxon, director of the NSA and U.S. Cyber Command, said on Thursday that U.S. officials were aware of the increasing importance of AI in the national security landscape and the opening of the new center was part of steps to shape the future of AI technology in the security, defense and intelligence sectors. We maintain an advantage in AI in the United States today. That AI advantage should not be taken for granted, Naxon said at the National Press Club in Washington, D.C., where he spoke about the opening of the center and the growing threat that China posed. The AI center will be incorporated into the NSA's present cybersecurity collaboration center, he said, where it will become the main point for promoting the secure adoption of the new artificial intelligence capabilities across the national security enterprise and the defense industry base. We must build a robust understanding of AI vulnerabilities, foreign intelligence threats to these AI systems and ways to encounter the threat in order to have AI security, he said. Asked about the U.S. using AI to automate analyses of threats, Naxon said that U.S. intelligence and defense agencies already use AI, though final decisions are still made by humans. He said the U.S. security agencies had not yet detected attempts by either Russia or China to influence the 2024 U.S. presidential elections. A number of elections will take place in other parts of the world before the U.S. presidential vote, he said, and the U.S. will work with partners and allies to help deter any such manipulation efforts. The establishment of an AI security center follows an NSA study that identifies securing AI models from theft and sabotage as a key national security challenge for the U.S., especially as generative AI technologies emerge with immense transformative potential for both good and bad actors. Still ahead, Sweden's Prime Minister announced that he will hold meetings with the head of the Swedish Armed Forces and Police Commissioner to deliberate ways to curtail gang violence following a wave of raids that have resulted in at least 11 people killed so far this month. 
Prime Minister of Kirsten said that on Friday he will meet with the Armed Forces Supreme Commander and the National Police Commissioner to explore how the Armed Forces can help police in their work against the criminal gangs. Sweden has never before seen anything like this, Christensen said on Thursday, according to reports. On Wednesday, two people were killed in separate shootings in Stockholm and a woman in her 20s was killed when a bomb tore up a house in Uppsala in the early hours of Thursday. It was not instantly clear in what capacity the military would get involved in addressing Sweden's gang problem, but formal proposals have aimed on soldiers taking over protection duties from police to free up more resource for crime fighting. Getting the military involved in crime fighting will be a highly unusual step for Sweden, but it, it underscores the severity of the gang violence that has claimed almost a dozen lives across the country so far this month, including teenagers and innocent bystanders. The police estimates that closely 30,000 people in Sweden are directly involved with or have ties to gang crime. The violence has also spread from major urban areas to smaller towns where violent crime was previously rare. The criminal conflicts in Sweden are a serious threat to the safety and security of the country, National Police Commissioner Andres Thunberg said in a statement. Over 60 people died in shootings last year in Sweden, the highest figure on record. This year is on track to be the same or worse. Swedish media have connected the newest increase in violence to a feud between rival factions of a criminal gang known as the Fox Trust Network. Earlier this week, two powerful blasts ripped through dwellings in central Sweden, injuring at least three people and destroying buildings. Sweden long stood, in, stood out in Europe along with Germany for having liberal immigration procedures and welcoming hundreds of thousands of asylum seekers from the Middle East. And Africa. More stories say China's information manipulation threatens freedoms. The United States has said China is spending billions of dollars a year to ship perceptions of China through influence, censorship, and disinformation in a large scale campaign that could threaten global freedoms. Beijing has invested billions of dollars to construct a global information ecosystem that promotes its propaganda and facilitates censorship and the spread of disinformation. On Thursday, the State Department spokesperson said in a statement following the publication of Engagement Center's report. The report noted that Beijing used a number of deceptive and coercive methods to try and influence the international information environment and bend the global information environment to its advantage. The report cautioned, referring to the country by the initials of its official name, People's Republic of China, unchecked the PRC's efforts will reshape the global information landscape, creating biases and gaps that could even lead nations to make decisions that subordinate their economic and security interests to Beijing's. Beijing has ramped up its influence campaigns on social media platforms such as X, formerly known as Twitter and YouTube in recent years, particularly over hot button issues such as Xinjiang, the South China Sea and Taiwan, while its state media has set up editorial partnerships with traditional and online media elsewhere in the world, sometimes even buying control of outlets. The US report recognized five key elements of China's global media strategy, leveraging propaganda and censorship promoting digital authoritarianism, exploiting international organizations and bilateral partnerships, pairing co-optation and pressure, and exercising control over Chinese language media. Taiwan, the self rule island Beijing claims as its own, has long been on the front line of China's media war. Foreign Minister Joseph Wu said, according to reports earlier this month, that Taipei was getting ready for Beijing to step up its misinformation and disinformation campaigns ahead of the presidential elections in January. He noted, too, how China had sought to frame the narrative about Ukraine in the eyes of the people of Taiwan. The State Department said that as of 2021, almost 100 influencers were known to be disseminating official Chinese messaging in at least two dozen languages on multiple social media platforms to a combined audience of over 11 million people. In Africa, UNICEF says Libyan floats displace over 16,000 children. UNICEF warned on Thursday that the deadly floats that devastated eastern Libya on September 10th displaced over 
and more than 16,000 children. Several more are affected due to lack of necessary services such as health and safe water supply, the UN's General Children Agency added. Storm Daniel swept across cities including Derna, Al Bayada, Sosa, Al Maj, Shahad, Taknis, Bata, Tomeita, Bursis, Tokra, and Al Bayer. While the number of children among the casualties is still unverified, UNICEF fears hundreds perished in the disaster, given that children account for about 40% of the population. In the heat region, out of 117 affected schools, four were damaged and 80 partially destroyed. This means children risk for the disruption to their learning. Some of the displaced families are hostel in schools. Waterborne illnesses are a rising concern due to water supply issues, major damage to water sources and sewer networks and the risk of contamination of the groundwater. In Derna alone, 50% of water systems are projected to have damaged. Adele Kord, UNICEF Regional Director in the Middle East and North Africa, who has just returned from a visit to al Bada and Derna said UNICEF has been working with authorities and partners since the beginning of the strategy to respond to the urgent needs of children and families in the affected areas. Kord also sounded the alarm on psychological burden children bear UNICEF is reviewing its humanitarian response appeal of US of 6.5 US dollars mil, million US dollars to integrate initial recovery attempts with an emphasis on education, health and water. To date the body has received about 25% of this fund. UNICEF has been supporting the children in eastern Libya since day 2 of the crisis. 65 metric tons of relief supplies have been delivered to affected areas, including medical supplies for 50,000 people for three months, family hygiene kits for almost 17,000 people, 500 children's winter clothing set, 200 school in a box kits, and 32,000 water purification tablets. UNICEF has also dispatched mobile child protection and psycho psychosocial support teams to help children cope with the emotional toll of the disaster a quick break we take now and when we come back i'll bring you more stories from nigeria do stay with us you're welcome back thanks for staying with us on zuma nigeria agf wants labor avoid indefinite strike Prince Latif Fagbemi, the Attorney General of the Federation and Minister of Justice, and has told organized labor to obey the June 5th order issued by the National Industrial Court, stopping both the Nigeria Labor Congress NLC and the Trade Union Congress TUC from going ahead with any industrial action over full subsidy removal and connected issues. The plan by both labor bodies to embark on an indefinite strike from October 3rd was a violation of the subsisting order and a disregard to the dignity and integrity of the court, Fagwami said in a September 26 letter to the lawyer of the NLC and TUC, Femi Falana San. The AGF urged Falana to prevail on his clients to respect the order of the court and permit room for ongoing negotiations between parties on how to tackle the challenges associated with full subsidy removal. He noted that from the communique issued by the NLC after its National Executive Council meeting on August 31st and the September 26 joint communique by the presidents of the NLC and TUC, it was obvious that the proposed strike is premised principally in the furtherance of issues connected with the removal of full subsidy, hike in full price and consequential matters of making provisions for palliatives and workers' health care. Now Nigeria to celebrate 63 years independence anniversary. Since 1960, when Nigeria became politically independent from the British colonial government, there has never been this level of sadness occasioned by economic hardship, rising poverty, insecurity and other forces widening the national fault lines. October 1st anniversary indeed has always come with a fanfare, but this year the mood is that of a funeral, the opposite of a country that began with high hopes. The creepy feeling is not unrelated with reducing hope and near hopelessness nationwide. The federal government must have gauged the mood of most Nigerians when it declared that the independence celebration on Sunday will be low-key as foreigners will not be invited to commemorate the day with Nigeria. 
However, George Akume, the secretary to the government of the Federation SGF, said low-key celebration has nothing to do with whether we are not doing well. Economic times are hard. We are looking at it not just at the national level, but also as a family. The theme of the anniversary is Nigeria at 63, renewed hope for unity and prosperity. But there is nothing to celebrate now in Nigeria as the country is presently facing an existential crisis. The death of leadership since the collapse of the First Republic in January 15, 1966 has given rise to primordial sentiments, clan clashes that give birth to deadly separatists and terrorist groups that have killed thousands of people and security agents in the country. While the indigenous people of Biafra, IPOP, Eastern Security Network, ESN, are holding the country by the jungle from the southeastern part of the country, Boko Haram and bandits have made the northern part of Nigeria unsafe for social and economic activities. Southwest is grappling with kidnappers that have taken over its forest, making farming almost impossible. So also in the, is the infrastructural deficit that makes investment in Nigeria less attractive. Most countries that got their independence at almost the same year as Nigeria have passed the teeth in economic stages and are ranked among the developed countries in the world, while Nigeria is still crawling at 63. As of 2021, Nigeria ranked 126 in the Economic Complexity Index, ECI, 1.56 and 52 in total exports, 57.7 B US dollars, while Singapore ranked 6 and 19 in total exports, 351 billion US dollars. For instance, Nigeria and Malaysia shared certain features with high hopes to lead the world. After all, both are poorer societies, both experience colonialism, and both are federal and democratic states. However, unlike Nigeria, Malaysia has been able to tackle not only its cultural and religious differences, but also economic challenges. And finally, on the news, federal government ignores debt, takes 1.95 billion U.S. dollars World Bank loans. Amidst concerns over the country's increasing debt profile, Nigeria secured a total of 1.95 billion U.S. dollars in loans from the World Bank in the first four months of President Bola Tinubu's administration. The loans are for education, 700 million U.S. dollars, power, 750 million U.S. dollars, and women empowerment, 500 million U.S. dollars, according to a report. For several Nigerians, long years of infrastructure decay and rising unemployment have triggered an increased feeling of bitterness whenever they hear the government's intention to borrow. Although some of them realistically agree that resources are thin, considering an outsized population, however, they believe the past borrowings have not been justified. Economists say it is not wrong for countries to borrow as long as the loans will be aimed at specific infrastructure that will, in turn, make life better for the people. Data from the Debt Management Office showed the federal government had an outstanding external debt of 38.8 billion US dollars as of June 2023. Reports showed Nigeria has secured three major loans from the World Bank since President Tinubu Azim office on May 29, 2023, totaling 1.95 billion US dollars. The federal government secured a 750 US million US dollars loan from the World Bank to facilitate power projects across the nation. On June 19th, the loan with project IDP P174622 was approved on June 9th, making it the first World Bank loan approved under the administration of President Tinubu. The international lender said the fresh loan would serve as additional financing for the power sector recovery performance-based operation, which was first. A recap of major stories says over 2,500 dead missing in Mediterranean in 2023. U.S. offers $5 million U.S. million for Ecuador election murder in sight. Ukrainian drone attack hits pa Russian power substation. U.S. National Security Agency launches AI Security Center. And Swedish Prime Minister seeks help from military. That's all on the news. Thanks for watching. Happy uh, weekend.